Welcome, everybody. This is Hugh Massey, the chairman and founder of DNA Behaviour. And today I'm delighted to be hosting another one of our identity conversations. And I've got a, a long-term friend of, of me and our business, Jeff Karp. Uh, we've worked together for the last 15 or 16 years in the deployment of financial DNA. And Jeff is the president of Karp Financial Strategies. Uh, based in Mooresville, North Carolina, just outside Charlotte. He lives on uh, that beautiful lake there. And you know, he, one of the big things Jeff does in life is to help clients through uh, navigating retirement and uh, being smart-minded about it and reinventing their lives. So over to you, Jeff. So why don't you just tell us a little bit about your life and career to date and how you've got to this place of doing this wonderful work. Uh, thank you, Hugh. And uh, as always, it's fun to just sit and, and chat with you uh, on so many different topics. That's been a gift in my life. Uh, and it kind of goes to one of the philosophies is that life really becomes about the people you meet and the experiences you have. And, and if I had to drill down to what sums up why I do what I do and how I've lived my life, that would be it is just have as many different experiences you can possibly put together so that when we're all sitting around uh, in our 80s recounting how life has gone, uh, you got lots to talk about. Uh, it's almost as simple as that in a way, yet my blog being titled Permission Granted uh, came from the fact that a lot of people almost needed permission to go play. And, and especially on the retirement side of the world, we all know raising kids and, and you know, building careers is very uh, emotionally and time uh, consuming. But as you look at this period of reinvention, as you call it and I call it, uh, i.e. retirement, and you take away all the places and things you're supposed to do, that can be pretty intimidating when you now got to fill your day if you haven't been thinking and planning ahead of what to do. Um, you know, interestingly, a good friend of mine, we were just talking about the water skiing part. He's always wanted a water ski. He's retired. And he literally said to me, oh, it's too late for me. I'll never be able to learn uh, at this point in my life. And of course, my answer was why? Yeah. Uh, and he didn't have a good answer for that. And that's the permission granted. I told him, I said, yeah, I'll take you out and we'll go water skiing. You may fall on your face, but go try it. Go have the experience. So that's really how I built the practice in my life. And, you know, if you want to go all the way back, I picked up all my stuff out of college, left the New York area and moved to Richmond, Virginia. People say, why'd you pick there? Why not? It wasn't where I grew up. So let's go see what it's like to live in Richmond, Virginia. So what was the motivator, motivator or catalyst underneath, Jeff, that got you to give yourself permission or grant yourself permission to go and live this, you know, fulfilled and meaningful life where you soaked up every experience you can? I didn't have them as a kid. There was a big hole in my upbringing, um, Interestingly, I'm the middle child, so maybe there's all those psychological damage of being the middle child. Uh, I'm not a psychologist from that standpoint, but uh, I just figured I had nothing to lose and I can always go back. But how bad could it be? Um, and, and since it did start pretty early on and I've done every bit of the, yeah, look, we'll tr try that this job. If that doesn't work, then I'll go get another job. And, Sure, it can be scary. I wound up unemployed at one point because of these results, but that's where you just pick up and fix it. Maybe that's my engineering degree by nature. But to be unemployed is an experience in its own right in some ways, isn't it? I mean, maybe not a great one, but it is an experience. It's, it, it, they're, they're, they're good and bad, no question, but five years later, it's an experience. It loses a lot of the emotion and it just becomes a cog in the wheel. And of course, everybody always says, well, if you connect the dot, you wouldn't have gotten to where you are if you didn't go through this other path. And a lot of times that path is uh, 
what we'll call a negative experience that caused something to, to open the door to a really positive one? Well, a lot of the time it is how you take a negative experience and turn it into a positive one. And sometimes I think being limited in choices is not a bad thing because it gets you to, uh, it gets you to focus a little bit more. Well, um, or it gets you sometimes to open up your mind and, and just kind of dump everything and just get, get to the point where you go, okay, it probably can't get worse than that for right now. So I might as well just be free yeah. of all of it and see what happens. Yeah. That, and I think that's, you know, that's the other approach, what, what some call the Japanese garden approach, you know, lay it down and uh, uh, walk on it and see, you know, see where the energy takes you. And that's, I had not heard that. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, that's another approach to life, which is, which is important. But I think, you know, you and I as entrepreneurs, Jeff, uh, um, well, we're not employed in a way, but we're also unemployable as well. <laughs> uh, at this point, I would agree. Yeah, totally unemployable now. But, uh, but that's all good for, you know, for helping people. So, so let's just talk a little bit more about how you help people through this life reinvention and then align it to their finances. So the, the conversation always, everybody always wants to start with money. You know, I don't have enough to do this. I don't have enough to do that. And the first question is always, how do you know? And by the way, the answer usually is, well, I really don't. I just don't think so. Yeah. Um, so you really got to set, reset people's expectations on so that, well, if money wasn't an object, then lay it out for me. What's, what are you doing? Uh, where are you doing it? Uh, all that good stuff. And once people start to be a little more expressive of their goals instead of the dollar and cents amount, then my job is to take what I've got and see what I can make have happen. Doesn't always work. Sometimes there are goal adjustments as well, but I always figure I cannot possibly get started on the goals if nobody knows, <laughs> they don't know what they are. I don't know what they are. Um, and in, in connecting people and their personalities to the conversations we've had for years, um, a lot of times people are who they think they are. They just need to sort of see it in front of them to confirm that they're not just guessing on some of that stuff. Yeah, it needs to get a bit more concrete because I, I think like you, I've come across people that I, I think are quite wealthy, got quite a lot of money and good income streams, and uh, they, they would say to me, Hugh, I haven't got enough money to retire on, and then you get them to break it down, and they've got more than enough, and it's a mindset that's restricting their lives. Uh, and then sometimes, of course, on the other side, you get someone who's just uh, got unrealistic expectations and wants to have everything, hasn't figured out what's important or what's a need and a want, what's important. Um, and, and, you know, you've got to work at it from the other side, but, but, they're, all, they're, but they're all part of the conversations, aren't they? Uh, hopefully they're part of the conversations because some people get a little intimidated by opening up on some of the stuff and so they'll fight you all day long. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and, and that's part of breaking down the barrier. And, and my guess is some of those people we would find by doing personality testing, th there's, there's a fight gene in there somewhere that needs to be identified and softened a little bit. So they become more open and conversational. Because something they've said today, it's really triggered me is your blog on permission granted. And I know we started our, at this conversation with that, but I'm quite triggered in a very positive way with that because I think a lot of people, even if they've got the money and know they've got the money and got it, got it all planned out, aren't prepared to give themselves the permission or there's some blockage there giving themselves permission. You know, I, I would put myself in that as well. Uh, in, in that area at times, you know, I've, I think I've given myself permission recently to, to go to the golf course a bit more often and, you know, uh, and do some other activities and be a kid sports and things like that. But I think that's a really big issue, even if, you, even if you've got the finances sorted out, is just 
getting past that barrier of saying, you know what, you're allowed to go and do that. It's okay. And, and the reason you, you asked me, you know, at some point to, to bring in, and I will here, you know, why did I get so connected to your financial DNA tools? Um, because when you start looking at personalities, I test out as an influencer. Yeah. So you need a potentially somebody like yourself needs a, a person you who can knows how to influence you to accept that. Whereas if I'm a and I can't remember what the the, the right term is, but if I'm going to come in with a sledgehammer and try and pound you into a change of behavior, you're going to you're going to fight it. Whereas my style is, is more conversational, it's gentler. And I had a client uh, earlier, we had just done, it was about a week ago, her financial DNA. She loves to golf. She said, it's kind of weird. I'm a girl and with my girlfriends, they don't get why I want to golf. <clears throat> and I'm not giving it enough time. I said, why aren't you? And she didn't have a good answer. She said, well, basically it takes time and I'm not allocating time. So we talked about her schedule and she has a time allocated in her mind to travel. I said, well, just put around you know, nine holes of golf in your travel mentality. Yeah. And, and then you'll give yourself permission to go do that. And it was like a foreign concept for her. Uh, very um, exciting. But she would not have gotten there because she's very functional analytical. She, analytical she couldn't get past the scheduling component. I gave her permission to take something that's really not travel and use that acceptance in her mind to make it go happen. So that's where I think the power of me understanding the other person and then helping them understand themselves. And that's where the permission granted came from. Some of the stuff I give people permission to do afterwards, you kind of scratch your head and go, they needed permission for that, but they did. And that's that's the fun I have. Well, I think the, the, the thing with financial DNA, uh, which just for the listeners is uh, a, a, a system that we have at DNA Behaviour where, where, where a client and, of course, an advisor like Jeff or anybody in the family can go and take 10 or 12 minutes online and get a pretty uh, in-depth uh, readout on who they are and, uh, you know, what your strengths and struggles are. And I think... Where, where it takes you to is where are you getting yourself tangled up? You know, I think that's what yes. you can see because it's not just a money conversation. It's uh, where's the person getting themselves tangled up? And obviously the lady that you were talking, talking to, you know, about golf is tangled up on time management. Um, now money's wrapped up in there as well because she's got to go to work or, uh, you know, got other priorities as well and, finan- you know, financially how it's all paid for. But uh, I think that's the thing, Jeff, is it helps you unravel how someone, um, where someone's tangled up and then how to communicate with them, how to adapt the communication. Well, and how to help give them uh, the permission granted, if I can beat that dead horse for a second, to op- be open to new and different ways to solve the problem because sometimes they never really knew what the problem was. And, and that's not a slight. There's always money, by the way. I'm not so altruistic having done yeah. this for 28 years that uh, I don't think at the end of the day, you got to handle the money right as well. But what's the reason to handle the money right? Um, what's important about having the money? Because otherwise, if it's just put food on the table and keep the lights and heat on, most people do not have that as a high motivator to pay attention and work so hard. I think one of the one of the advantages for you of or strengths for you of being an influencer is the communication and relationship skills that come with that. And you know not to hit people with the sledgehammer, but at the same time, the influencer is also like you, is quite logical. And mm-hmm. you're a, and, and being creative, you're able to sort of see inside inside what the problem really is. Um, because sometimes people uh, think the problem's uh, in one place, but really it's in another. And I think your advantage is that you're able to see, we're using financial DNA as well, but just your natural style is really get them to see in where, where that problem exists. Um, 
Well, and I listen. Um, and, yeah. And there are other advisors that listen as well. I'm not putting myself in the only one on the planet, but when you combine the fact that my dad was a CPA and I'm an engineer by degree, so the analytic part of you know doing the puzzle per se and understanding how the pieces can fit, that in combination with the influencer, you know, listening side of things. Uh, and and feeling that every person's problem is is important um, that that's that that's what my practice is about at this point and why I talk about you know what I do and what's important is the true wealth component of the again the experiences you have and the people you meet along the way not just what again when you got twelve percent or twelve point two percent or all that stuff not say I don't think it's important but it's not. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, I would put you in the. Yeah, I, I sort of call myself a reformed accountant, but I think you're more of a reformed engineer yep. in the sense that you know how to use numbers and analytics uh, to get to the core of a problem, but it's really about the relationship skills, understanding that people have a life purpose or need to have a life purpose and find that meaning and getting them to see that and then how to live it. Uh, is a is another whole dimension that you're bringing to the table for your client. Absolutely, well said. That's exactly right. And so, you know, if we're if we're aligning, you know, re- re- helping people reinvent their lives, which could be creating more time in certain areas or just untangling their mindset. But but also, I think Jeff, an area that you you do a lot of work with is is the income planning and. Not every financial advisor uh, totally, fo- I mean, every, at the end of the day, that's a subject that's addressed, but I think you've made a, a, a big pitch on that, on, on, on getting the income structure right to, to be able to do these things. You know, what do we give up when we retire is a paycheck, Yeah, i.e. an income stream. So it's very comfortable. It's very familiar to talk about money, <coughs> excuse me, that comes in on a you know, regular basis, every week, every two weeks, whatever it is, and structuring how you spend around that cash flow. So sure, in retirement, eventually you'll have the Social Security kicking in, maybe you have a pension from a company, but your portfolio can generate income as well, depending on how you structure it. Certain holdings do and certain holdings don't within the portfolio, my job, but my job to work with my client to understand how big that flow needs to be to let them do what they want to do. Do you think your clients, when they come to see you, you know, first up, uh, really understand income flows and how, how it's going to come in and where it's going to come from? And have they got the capital there to generate it or are they just very focused on how much money do I have as a capital lump sum, you know, do you know, do you have a lot of conversations on how that gets broken down for them and the shifts that need to get made? Um, So the answer to the first questions is no and yes. Uh, No, I don't think they have. Well, remember it's a very emotional time when you're making that transition. So everything is sort of, overwhelming having gone from predictable and steady. Um, so I think all of that gets put on the table. Uh, I, the, probably the most common question I get on income is when can I start social security and how much do I get? And Cause that's the known factor. If there's a pension uh, less and less with corporations, but if there still is a, a company has a pension, there's, there's a decision planning tree on that, but uh, no, I got a bucket of money. Am I going to be okay? Yeah, because I think a lot of people, you know, my experience is a lot of people look at the uh, the total amount they have, but they don't really understand what can be done with it. Um, well, and, and how to access it and the tax ramifications of accessing it and, and all that good stuff. <clears throat> but again, when somebody says to me, am I going to be okay? My first question is doing what? If you're going to sit in your house watching cable TV, you know, eating cans of soup. Yeah, you're great. You're fine. Uh, If you get a little more aspiration than that, 
that's what we need to talk about. What does that look like? What are you doing? What What are your hopes and, and desires of what the days get filled with now? Then we can start looking at, are you going to be okay or not? It's a fair yeah. question, but it's undefined. Yeah, well, I think that's a, you know, that's a whole big area, though, to help people through, um, particularly when they're getting closer to retirement, or hopefully they get it sorted out some years beforehand, so there's still an opportunity to put more money in the bucket, I suppose, to to create that, you know, the, the necessary income stream. But I don't think everybody uh, figures it out until um, it's too late for some people. Or they just go through that mental thing of, you know, what am I actually going to do in retirement? Um, yes to all of it. Ideally, if we could ever teach the 30-year-old to pay attention, yeah. you, know, <clears throat> you don't have to be knee-deep in the process. But it, it, uh, I used to teach at a university financial planning class, and there was, a, and I know he was an 18-year-old, um, and I picked him out and I looked him square in the eye and I said, I'm looking at a multimillionaire. And of course, an 18 year old was shocked. But when I broke down how simple it is, because you have the time factor working for you, uh, it opens up a lot of doors. And so there's also a few regrets of if I put a little more away in my 401k as I get to be 55 or 60, if I had you know, done a few things differently, uh, but regrets don't help you at that point. It doesn't matter what you should have done, uh, but teach your kids and, and send the message down the road. Yeah, regrets, I think, the worst thing you can have in, in your life. Yeah. Um, that, that's my view because uh, you can't get that back. That's, that's the real problem, whether it's a regret around relationships or not living life experiences like we talked about before or not setting yourself up to live them, uh, you know, for the remainder of that, that, that you're on this earth or you know, uh, to have the one medical event being lights out, like we talked about before, you know, that's problematic too if you haven't gone and lived. Um, so, well, and, and regrets are human nature. Everybody's going to have a few. It's whether yeah. you put them in the bucket of, you know, I really regret I didn't do this, but there's nothing I can do about it, or do you let it limit you the rest of the way? Um, but one of the first, what I'll call silly trips, I ever took, well, not ever, but pretty close. Uh, I was, it was in my unemployed stage and my dad and uh, mom were in France and they said, hey, we're gonna be here if you guys wanna come. And theoretically, probably shouldn't have from a cost standpoint, but how often do you get that kind of experience opportunity? And you know, there was no logic. That's the whole uh, work that I do where you ask, where does some of this come from? It was, it was the best decision I'd ever made because yeah. I never got that opportunity to do that travel with my, especially my dad, ever again. So, you know, sometimes there's a regret, um, but you just got to get out of your own way sometimes and, and get close. So, yeah, so you try to try and teach people. Yeah, you've got to grant yourself permission to have the once in a lifetime experience. Yep. And, and that's, you know, I think permission granted is a really big, message for people and and maybe that's where jeff i suppose i was going to sort of head to next in our conversation was just around your identity out there in the in the community and as a leader in uh wealth management uh and 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 and, and life um you know how do you see your identity showing up in the future that's an interesting question because part it's all based on, on what I decide to do action wise, how people interpret that. I don't know, but um, I guess sort of still tied into the same thing. Uh, so I spent two terms on a fire department board of my local community, not because, you know, I grew up with a passion for the fire department, but it was serving and <coughs> local and just interesting, you know, one of those experiences um, you know, we've talked about over the years, my time in Rotary and, and what you yeah. give back to the community, um, you know, those kinds of organizations, soup kitchen uh, and, and uh, the charitable pieces of I almost get as much out of the experience as I give into the group that needs help. 
Um, so I try and make my reputation as really not about me, but about all the things that I can help and improve on and, you know, participate in. Uh, and I will continue to do that, um, you know, with, with the time that's not spent just, you know, doing my job. Um, yeah. But the positive impact on people's lives, I just, you know, one of my, I got a bunch of little, what I call cute little sayings. Uh, and one of them that I, you know, certainly have taught my daughter over the years and continue to throw out there is put a smile on somebody's face every day and you'll be rich beyond your wildest dreams. Um, and that's what I try and do. So, you know, if somebody, you know, I'll talk to just about anybody um, and see if there's something that I can do to have them walk away with a little better step than, than when we got talking and, and just make it a positive uh, experience, uh, you know, to go with, you know, picking up the thing that fell for someone, you know, that kind of stuff, which I think every, most people do. Yeah. I think putting a smile on people's face is a big thing. And I, 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 I get that you, that's coming out of the, the charitable work that you do, you know, with the fire department and rotary uh, and other areas, but also with the clients. And that's uh, sort of, I think, as I said before, a few minutes ago, very triggered by the permission granted. Mm -hmm. I think the more people that you can give permission to or let them give permission to themselves, more to the point, but you inspiring them, you're going to have a lot of smiles on faces. Uh, certainly hope so. And, and it's little stuff. I mean, especially over the last, frankly, year and a half, people struggle to do that. And, and when you interact uh, and you, there's a positive energy or attitude, uh, it's really hard for other people to kind of stay grumpy, frankly. Um, so it just brings a whole lot calmer energy to at least people I'm around or I try. See, I look at you as, you know, as I've been listening to this today and I know you've got the blog permission granted, but I look at, I, I think this identity for you, Jeff, is around being Mr. Permission Granted, you know, is giving, you've given yourself that permission for, for quite a long time now, but, um, but really all the way through running CARP financial strategies. But I think being able to really emphasise that with people, that's what you're going to get from me. I'm going to give you permission. To explore well, people, and try and to reinvent on. your life. You know, yep. and I think that, life. yep, yep, and I think that's sort of really to me where it is. And then, of course, the financial planning and wealth management strategies will will all follow suit once you've figured out what you're going to grant yourself permission to do, um, and, yep. and you're going to inspire them to do that to take that step. And then it can be funded. I mean, people have the money generally. Generally, do. do the other thing which gets interesting here is. People also try and solve the problem. And, and again, just recently had, which is why it popped in my head. Um, I had explained to somebody that you don't have a problem to solve. You have a lot of them because your retirement's 25 years, God willing, again. Um, so why do you have to decide what you're going to do for the next 25 years? What do you want to do for the next three years? Yeah. And then when that's done, check the box, feel great about it. And what do we want to do next? Because being flexible becomes not so intimidating. And so you're more comfortable with, the, yeah, that was fun for a couple of years. I want to live at the beach for a few years and then I'm done. I want to, uh, I want to work part-time for five years and then I don't want to do it anymore. Okay, great. We'll build a plan that allows you to do that. And then when that's done, we'll adjust the next piece of the plan. Yeah, I think that's the that's the key there and something I thought of earlier in our conversation, but I didn't raise it, but I'll sort of raise it now as we're concluding up. The gig economy has got really big. And I think for people to give themselves permission to say, you know what, I'm I've got two thirds of the income I need to retire out of my out of my capital. But you know what? If I go and do A, B, C, D work for yeah. two days a week or 10 days a month or whatever it is doing these projects, I can supplement all of that. And guess what? I'm going to be happy. I can be out on the golf course when I want to be. I can travel, yeah. um, Zoom, oh, and, 
social media and all the platforms out there, technology platforms will allow me to do that. And so long as I can accept, I don't have to run up to an office in New York in a blue suit, white shirt, red tie every day. Exactly. Uh, you know, it all works. Well, the problem is we automatically associate uh, work with a paycheck. What if you were getting paid for your hobby? Yeah. Is it work or is it a hobby that you figured out how to get paid to do? Um, You're correct. You know, I, I love the, the gardening landscaping thing. So if I went and worked at a landscaping place, is that really work or is it giving me an opportunity to be around things I love to learn about anyhow? And you could still give, help people uh, get a lot of permission in their lives as well from doing that, from doing that, you know, because yeah. that's a driver. Um, so, well, Jeff, you know, it's been fantastic spending time with you uh, today and, uh, you know, connecting on identity, but also I think importantly on, you know, helping people grant themselves permission in their lives to go and do what they really desire to do and to be happy. And I think to walk away with a smile on their face and it's been uh, fantastic. And, you know, it's a nice sunny day here in Atlanta and you've given me um, some more reasons to smile because I'm going to go and spend the afternoon on the golf course. There, there you go. I love it. We were supposed to be out on the lake. I don't know if we're going to get there today um, for the afternoon as well. And it, you just grab the little times of, of life fulfillment well, and I, I'm one of those ones. I've done some water skiing before, but said I was too old probably to restart. So next time I'm up your way, Come I've on. friends who live there, I'm going to um, drop by and get behind your speedboat. Don't, don't worry. I got trainer skis. We, okay, we, good. We, we, we can uh, teach a uh, eight-year-old and uh, more than eight-year-old. Well, I've got an eight-year-old and a nine-year-old who'd love to uh, have a crack and, uh, oh, and, 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 and dad as well. So, uh, and mum. So, That'd be fantastic, Jeff. So it's great spending time with you. Hugh, you as well. Thanks for the time and uh, the conversation. Always enjoy it.